I'm going to read a scripture. I'm going to give us a point, some, some manna, if I could, this morning as I was praying for us. Uh, I just want to read a, a scripture, if we could stand, that's really near and dear to my heart. This is one of the first scriptures I fell in love with when I got born again. When I actually first started reading my Bible and I found this scripture. Isn't it great? When you first get saved, you read stuff in the Bible that you n never knew existed if you were raised in a church like I was. All we really knew a little bit about Jesus. I mean, Sunday school, we'd have little felt, felt pictures of Jesus and we would do crafts with popsicle sticks and things like that. And I thought I knew Jesus and then I could actually read my Bible. I'm like, dear Lord, I didn't know anything. I mean, I, I'm not saying that in a condescending way. If you just got born again, I'm, I'm just saying there, there were so many things. And one of the things that intrigued me at the beginning was prophecy. And this is the messianic prophecy in Psalm 22 about the coming of the Christ and the crucifixion and what he did on that day. And it begins and it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And why are you so, so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and I'm not silent, but you're holy and throned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted you and they were never ashamed. But I'm a worm and no man, a reproach of men, despised by the people, all those that see me. They laugh me to scorn. They shoot at the lip saying and shake their head. He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. But you are he who brought me out of the womb. You made me to trust while on my mother's breast, I was cast upon you from birth and from my mother's womb. You have been my God, so be not far from me. For trouble is near and there's none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape upon me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is like a dried up pot shared. And my tongue clings to the roof of my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. And the congregation of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. This was hundreds of years before crucifixion. This was written. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all of my bones. They look and they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. They cast lots for my vesture. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far from me. O oh, my strength, hasten and help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. And he says, you've heard me. I'll declare your name to the brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I'll praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise Him. And you descendants of Jacob, glorify Him and fear Him. All of you offspring of Israel, for He has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has He hidden His face from Him. But when He cried, He heard Him. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I'll pay my vows before those who fear Him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. And those who seek Him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. And it goes on to say, for time's sake, that the ends of the world will know them. And even before our kids are born, there's going to be a legacy for them to always glorify the Lord. <clears throat> Lord, we just ask you this morning, add your blessing to the reading of this word today. <laughs> I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. I thank you for all that you are. And I pray in 2019 that we would get one thing in us that you are closer, you are nearer, you are more a part of our life than ever before. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. You may be seated if you want to. This text is, is so precious to me because the first time I read it, it was like, dear Lord, this was the exact prophecy. I mean, I mean Israel was 
had a full comprehension of that prophecy, and they're, they're doing everything in it, and, and they don't get it. And, and that still blows my mind. I, I, I still love the layers of this. But in this redemption story, the, the thing that sticks out to me is that the Lord began with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we understand, and we read that the Lord had not forsaken him. But I believe, this is my opinion, I believe in the beginning of that text, he was actually becoming under the duress or the pressure of the first Adam. He was, he was feeling the full consequence of Adam's transgression to the Lord. And we understand that, that that was a lie in the first place because God was never far from him. His seared conscience because of sin actually caused him to run from God. But it goes on to say, you know, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so, so far from helping me? And he, and he goes on to say this. He said, I'm a worm and no man at all. He says, I'm basically worthless. And so in this, we understand that Jesus, who knew no sin is becoming sin in that analogy that you and I might be made the righteousness of God. And so all of the trauma and all the trials that Jesus is going through in Psalms 22, understand that. He's doing that once. He's doing that for us so that we don't have to ever live like that again. When I was age eight, I asked the Lord into my heart and the devil got me good. He lied to me because he said this, when I didn't get an answered prayer in two days, he said, God is real, Jesus is real, he died for your sins, he's afar off, and he's indifferent. And I felt like God was a distant God instead of an ever-present help in times of success and in times of trouble. And so I felt this distance between me and God. And the reality in this text is it says that when Jesus entered into that covenant that I never have to be distant from God ever Again, that he's right there. I mean, he's right here. Do you realize the, the only thing that was bad before the curse? You know, he made it, it's good. He made it, it's good. He made it, it's good. And then there was one thing that was not good before the curse, and it was not good that man be alone. It was not good that man would ever feel disconnected from relationships. And I really believe this right now. In fact, when you look around in America, David said this in one text. He said, you know, I looked at my right and I looked at my left. And he said, nobody stood with me. Nobody cared for my soul. With all of the social media and all of the stuff that we have going on right now and our ability to have smartphones, it still does not cease to amaze me how lonely and how needy people are. That you can be in a room full of thousands of people. You can have thousands of Facebook friends. You can even have relationships with individuals and, and still feel like you're dying on the vine because there's a part of God that can only fill the part of you that's lacking. And, and if, you, if you don't get uh, Psalm 22 settled in your heart, that Jesus died so that you never have to be separated, that you never have to be lonely again. You'll only have dysfunctional and codependent relationships all your life because people cannot meet that need. The number one need of everybody is acceptance. The number one fear in all people is rejection. And these two things wrapping around themselves are driving every single person on the face of the planet, even right now. I look before the, before the cross, the, the preamble to what happened here. Jesus was in heaven. And you've got to believe that there was uh, at least six degrees of separation between him and the Father when he laid down the expression of his deity in Philippians, the second chapter, and came in the form of a man. Now, we, we realize that they were one. They were father and they were son. They were, they were close with each other. They were in communication with each other. But the relationship had changed when he became the son of man, not just the son of God. And so he laid down that for a season. And he came as the form of a child, a Jew. And just as soon as the kid is born, understand this, his parents immediately became refugees. So everybody within the small community that, that Joseph and Mary had, 
they had to get away from them while weaning the child. And wherever Jesus went, understand, when people would hear the age of Jesus, they had to not believe him because every child his age had been killed because he was born. I'm 10 years old. No, that doesn't exist, Chip. There are no such thing as 10-year-olds. Herod took care of that. Do you realize the stigmatism that that kid had to carry? I mean, yeah, he was the son of God, but he was the son of man. He was touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He felt like a human. And so, exile from his family. Obviously, at some point in time, his father, Joseph, his stepdad, we'll call that, had to have passed away sometime within his childhood. Scripture actually says his brothers and his sisters thought he was beside himself, thought he was crazy. They thought their perfect brother was completely nuts. And then as he, as he comes into the place of maturity, he finds out that his nation considers him to be a traitor. And his church considers him to be a heretic. And a sinner. Then all of a sudden, he actually gets a following. He starts discipling people. And within one sermon, 70 of his disciples leave. They heard the joke but didn't wait for the punchline. And then all of a sudden, coming up to Psalm 22, <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is even the ones closest to him, all except for one disciple, ran when he was arrested. How I many know he knows what loneliness feels like? And him to hang on that cross. <laughs> And suffer all of the rejection. Listen, to the same degree that Jesus was rejected upon the cross. Get this in your mind. To the very same degree in which Jesus was rejected, you are accepted if you dare to believe it. He said, listen, I didn't go through all of that. I didn't go through all that for nothing. The great, the great thing is with this, and in fact, psychologists did a study of America, and they found that the mental condition of America is lonely. The mental condition. In World War II, Nazis perfected torture, but it wasn't starvation, and it wasn't the gas chambers. It was isolation. They said, you want to break a person's soul, you just lock them up with themselves for a while. You just get them alone. You get them isolated, and they'll die themselves from the inside out. Years ago, before we planted the church, I was walking through a place called The Shoe. <laughs> 23 and a half hours a day, solitary confinement at Carlisle Penitentiary. I'll never forget seeing these guys and their hands hanging out, and I just was broken, went into intercession. Can't these guys go to heaven too? So I thought the Lord was calling me to reach people like that. People that are 23 and a half hours a day solitary confinement that don't have a church. I said, I said Lord, give me everybody that, that maybe other churches don't want. And so that's, that was the whosoever thing inside of me. Now, 20 years later, I realized that that wasn't about prisoners out in there. That was about prisoners right now. There's a vast majority in our culture right now who are living a life of isolation because they've never really understand the full appreciation and accepted acceptance that the Lord has for us. I think about Elisha or Elijah. Elijah was not afraid to die. He was afraid to live alone. <laughs> He's like, take me home. Kill me. Send a chariot. Papa cap in me. And he kept saying this, because I'm the only one that's left. I believe that. That's why church is so important, so that you know you're not the only one, okay? You're not the only one. The Bible says uh, an isolationist is a backslider at heart. It means we need him personally, and we need 
the him in each other to complete the package. Moses said this. He said, Lord, I'll go back to where you want me to go on one condition. You've got to go with me. You've got to go with me. <laughs> Jesus said this. He said, go preach the gospel. Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Make disciples of all men. And he says this. This is the, this is the icing on the cake. Because if, if, if you don't get the I will before the thy will, it'll be empty religion and dead works. God says, I will do this. I will do this. Oh, oh yeah. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. He says, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. I'm not only going to be with you, I'm going to do it with you. I'm not only going to do it with you, I'm going to do it through you. That's how close I'm going to be to you. I'm going to work these things through you. In 2019, I'm going to say this. God is going to his manifest presence. You know what revival is? This is all... Revival are not, is not necessarily signs, wonders, and miracles. I'm thankful for signs, wonders, and miracles. It's not necessarily running the aisles, but I want to run the aisles. Leave pulpits at a single bound. Do carpet time, fall out, you know. <laughs> speak in tongues. I, I, I want all of that and then some, okay? But all revival is this. It is the strange consciousness of the presence of God gripping a group of people to where we don't care if we preach, we don't care if we sing, we don't care if we run the aisles because He's here. <laughs> because He's that good. He's just that good. We just come into church on, on Sunday mornings and say, oh, well, we got a program, we got a plan. But I have a hyper sense of awareness He's going to do better than that. Yeah. And so we're just going to enjoy Him. We're going to wait on Him. And we're going to wait on him. So it makes sense. We're going to wait on him to be patient. We're going to wait on him. We're going to serve him. Because when, when God gets what he wants, the ample supply overflows. What does he want? He wants one thing. He wants you. He wants to enjoy you forever. The next psalm is so great. It's, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I cannot shake you, God. <laughs> it's like, you're with me. Your rod and your staff, it comforts me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. And it goes on to say this. Surely goodness and mercy shall chase me down and tackle me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's a Davidic psalm. It's a Masonic. It's a Messianic psalm. This is Jesus speaking. After Psalm 22. He says, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Guess what? You're it. Jesus is excited that after everything he's been through, he gets to take up residence in Shelley Marcotte and never leave her and never forsake her. Amen. I want to roll out of bed in the morning. <laughs> like old Benny Hinn used to say, good morning, Holy Spirit. <laughs> I want to read one more scripture and then I'm going to pray for us. Everybody okay? <laughs> I want to say this today. E even if we are alone, God never wants us to suffer with loneliness. That's why He continually said, I'm there, I'm there. To the military guy that comes home, and the house is the same, but he's changed. Maybe to the elderly woman who's kids are too busy to visit like they need to. Maybe to the single mom who's struggling to make ends meet with a bunch of kids, right? Maybe to the kids whose parents got divorced and he feels like he's lost his mom and dad in some way. A person that's been diagnosed with some type of a debilitating disease. And the millions of other things that cause people to feel alone. I want to tell you, he's there. Oh, dear God, I love Psalms. It says this. Though your mother and your father forsake you, 
It goes on to say this, can a mother forget her only born son? And we say, no. Yeah, they do all the time. So the psalmist says, can a mother forget her only born son? And the Lord says, yeah, she might forget. But he says, I'll never forget. He says, because I've graven you in the palms of my hands. Every time he looks at his hands, I think, I think he'll have those scars in eternity. I do. As a sign of our covenant. Lord, you have searched me, Psalms 139, and you've known me. You've known my sitting down and my uprising. You've understood my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. And you're acquainted with all of my ways, for there is not a word on my tongue, but Lord, oh, you know it. You know it all together, and you have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high, and I cannot attain to it. I want to know the unknowable. Yeah, we should be, just be like Jenny. Just close your eyes and just soak in it. To know that which cannot be known, because it's got to be experienced. It can't be intellectual. <laughs> Such knowledge is too wonderful. It's too high for me. I can't attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take up the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall hold me. And if I say, surely darkness shall fall upon me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, darkness shall not hide me from you. But the night shines as the day and the darkness as the light. They're both alike to you. For you have formed me in the inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance, yet being informed and imperfect, and in your book they were all written. The days were fashioned for me, as yet there are none of them. How precious are your thoughts towards me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. And when I awake, you're still there. You're still there. I feel like I got a word for one in the church. I believe it's un unmarried. <clears throat> I think there's a woman in the church right now, or, or maybe somebody, it might even be a family member that you know that you've been praying for. And uh, I feel like there's an abusive relationship that's happened, and it's happened multiple times. And the reason, and it might not even be by one person, it could be by multiple people that you've dated in the past. And, and I, I feel like you're in a cycle, a, a cycle of abuse. And after time, you begin to feel like this is what I deserve because I keep getting the same thing over and over again. Uh, but the reason why you're making decisions, the Bible says, John said, lay the ax to the root. The reason why you're making the decision is because... Abu the, the fear of being alone is greater than the fear of abuse. The fear of being alone is greater than the fear of abuse. And the Lord wants you to know you are fearfully, wonderfully made, that He has an amazing plan for you, life, that you, d you deserve better, He's got better for you. And, and in 2019, do not be afraid to take a new street Amen. because you're, wor you're worth more than what you've gone through. Well, that's just a great time for an altar call in the service. No, I feel, I feel like that's for some, it for somebody. Don't be afraid to be alone. You just call on him. He's going to show up this year like never before. Let's stand to our feet if we could. Oh, my sarabakwe. How many of you just want to wake up in the morning and just be like, Wow, you are so real. You're so here. That's what started happening to me when I first started getting prophecy. Like my brother, my biological brother, which has a strong prophetic gift, 
he verbatim told me everything that I said to the Lord under a beech tree in the middle of the woods when I went to church that night. Everything. And it wasn't like two sentences. It was like a conversation. And I'm like, he was there. <laughs> Broke the bread. Drank the wine. Eyes are open. And I realized he was never distant. He was right there all along if I could have only believed it. So, Lord, I pray for a heightened sense of awareness and a consciousness in our fellowship, that in our family here, that, Father, we get just so addicted to your presence. We get so addicted to, to knowing you and walking with you and being with you and learning about you, and we crave you. Like David said, as a deer pants after the water brook, Lord, this year help us to long after you in that way. I pray for I thank you for bizarre and wonderful encounters of your spirit as well this year. I thank you, Lord, we don't have to ask you to come either because you promised us you'd never leave us nor forsake you. Help us to be aware of where you're at and what you're doing. And Lord, have your way. I speak a blessing on my family. Lord, bless them, keep them, make your face to shine upon them, be gracious to them, and lift up your countenance and give them peace in everything that they put their hand to. Let it glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen.